Hi there, this is John Felix or the Battlerite Profiler. Season 2 of the BPL is almost upon us and with that I've taken this channel into a new season as well. Along with some new content, I have, as you might have seen, given the entire channel a much needed visual rework. Or to be more accurate, Thane Barcelos has given the channel a visual rework. If you are as pleased with how things look as I am and want to see more, you can find Thane's info in the description. Speaking of a new season, I wanted to take a look back at season 1 of the BPL and then forward to what we could expect from season 2. And who better to do that with than the guy who've seen all the games that were played. This is Battle Royale Profile number 6 with In the Flesh. Okay, so this is Battle Royale Profile number 6 and with me in this episode we probably have one of the more familiar faces of the BPL. In the flesh, how do you do? Hey there, good. I'm excited to be on. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, I'm glad you're on the show. Uh, so, most people today they know you as a BPL caster, but before yes. that, you used to play Battle Right competitively as well. I uh, did, yeah. I used to play for uh, Team RMS with my teammates Vorim and Emperor way back in the day. And you were a one trick specialist, am I right? <laughs> Yep, I, I was a, a Jade player. I only played the Jade. I have like a, com a couple competitive games on Ashka, but like nothing to really uh, look seriously at. Why Jade then? Um, it's funny. Right back when I started playing, she's obviously the tutorial character, and I was just playing the tutorial, learning the game, learning what the buttons did. I was like, man, this character is kind of cool. So after playing the tutorial, I just decided that I would play Jade. I tried like two games of Shifu, lost them both instantly, and I was like, you know, I'm just going to stick with this invisible character. She seems sick. You got a comfort zone right away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. To say. <laughs> yeah. All right, but okay. After having played her a lot, though, what would you say makes Jade really good? So back in the day, the... Um... The thing that I found really good about her was, of course, the EX2 used to be immaterial, mm -hmm. the AOE immaterial, which was insane. And once I learned how to play around that, the character just like felt so good and so strong. I was like, there's no need for me to play anything else. This is just really strong. Um, so that's generally what I like stuck with at the beginning. I was like, this ability is how I want to play the game. All right. Um... So I heard you shy away from the term one trick on, on air, call it a specialist instead. Yeah. I like that. I like that term, actually. But would you say that being a specialist or one tricking is a, is a good way to get really good at the game? I think it's certainly a good way to learn the game, but I think it can only get you so far. I think back in the day when everybody was not as good at this game simply because it hadn't been out for so long and there hadn't been people like teaching or like there, there wasn't like the resources available that there are today. There weren't people that could like watch BPL and see what the really high level players were doing. So people were progressing more slowly. I think it was okay to one trick because people generally didn't know how to like play against your character, um, especially if they weren't like one tricks themselves. And if you could learn the matchups, then one tricking was fine and you could like get pretty good. But I think nowadays it probably isn't viable and you can only learn so much. But I, I think you pretty much have to learn more than one character now. All right. So a good way to start, but then you need to move on from that. Absolutely. It can only get you so far. So if if we go back then to you playing competitively or before that, how did you how did you get into the competitive scene of battle rights? So um, with me, competition's always been very fun. I always viewed tournaments as a really exciting thing. Like I used to play in trading card game tournaments when I was like mm -hmm. 17 and 18. Um, so when I got into this game and I saw there were tournaments, I was like, whoa, this is super cool. I, I want to find some people to play with. So I, I eventually networked and like made friends with enough of the high level players to be invited into their Discord servers. And then I, once tournaments started happening, I was just like, man, I want to play some of these. Uh, so I just like invited random people to play with and uh, found my way in that way. All right. So how long were you uh, a player? Um, I think I played, I played from October um, 2016 until probably fall of the next year. So I, I played competitively for like a year. And that's when I started really shying away from um, playing uh, and started casting instead. All right. 
So, so how did that transition happen? You quitting as a competitive player and starting to cast instead? So uh, actually very similar to how I started playing in tournaments. It was just a lot of talking to people. Um, my background luckily helped me a lot with casting because I was already somewhat of a trained speaker. So I was comfortable being on camera and being in front of a group and just kind of talking about stuff I felt comfortable talking about. Um, so since I had the skills required, I recognized that I should just make friends with other people that did it. So back in the day, there used to be the Battle Wrecked tournament series, as I'm sure you remember. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Findable Carpet and Rainiest Day were the casters. Um, and when I was a player, I just started talking to them outside of the tournaments, being like, hey, what's up? You guys want to play some Battle Right sometimes? Uh, and started playing with them and becoming their friends uh, for that. And I just let them know, I was like, hey, I have a background in speaking. I'm very knowledgeable on this game. If you guys ever need somebody, just let me know. And, uh, you know, eventually, after nagging them enough, they needed somebody. <laughs> so uh, the transition kind of happened that way. All right. What was it you did before then that made you a uh, trained speaker? I used to be a debater in high school. I was um, like a pretty competitive debater on the state level. Um, so I was very comfortable with like how to formulate sentences and thoughts and uh, things like that. I, I'm from Sweden and there are some things that are very American, I think, uh, uh -huh. in, in school that we don't have here. But I've heard the term debate team. Right, yeah. For schools. Do schools have teams? Yeah. Of people who debate and compete against each other. Yeah, exactly. That's uh, what I was a part of. I was a part of a team and we had like maybe eight different groups of people that all competed for our school. And we would drive around to different schools in the States and compete against other schools and have arguments over like various topics. I, I like that. I think that's really cool. I feel like I want to dive into this really deep because it's interesting, <laughs> but I think we should stick to battle right. But sure, sure. if I ever see you on uh, the next LAN or something, I'm <laughs> definitely going to pick your brain about being on a debate team because that sounds okay. really cool. <laughs> okay, so, um, but am I correct to say that you then became a part of Rivalry Esports as a yeah. caster? Yes, so uh, I casted the first Battle Wrecked, and then immediately after I was contacted for, or by some people on the Rivals squad saying, hey, we liked your casting on the Battle Wrecked show. If you ever want another place to cast, just let us know. And then I kind of saw that as my opportunity to like make my face more known by the community. Because if you want to be a caster, you need to be like well known and like people need to like accept you into the community, right? Yeah. So I was like, this is a good way to promote myself and also still be part of the group. Um, so I eventually just took that gig. Okay. So what would you, as an experienced speaker and now an experienced caster, say makes a good caster? Uh, first and foremost, it's weird that you refer to me as an experienced caster because sometimes in my head I'm still like, I'm still new at this. It, it's like, it's weird. I got a little bit of imposter syndrome going. But um, <laughs> so to like be a good caster, I think really important things are understanding key moments and like what's important in a game. Like if you spend all of your time focusing on something that doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things, uh, I think the viewers will kind of recognize that and be kind of like, hey, th this feels kind of off. It doesn't feel right. And even if they can't quite identify uh, what you're doing wrong, it like intuitively doesn't feel like a good cast. So I think being able to have a good focal point and understanding what you're talking about is very important. I also think it's very important as a caster to be able to work around who you're working with. I think it doesn't matter how good you are at analyzing a, a given topic. If you can't work with the person you're casting with and you just speak over them, people are going to notice and they're going to be like, oh, this this feels really bad. I don't want to hear this. These guys don't have any synergy. So I think it's a lot of being able to analyze a game and recognize what's important and also being able to work with people. All right. Um, do you feel like there's anyone you've cast with so far that you have like extra good synergy with? I, yeah, I thought you were gonna go the opposite way for a second. I thought I you were kinda, gonna ask I kind of, I kind of thought about it, but I <laughs> thought, hey, wait a minute, he still works with all those people like every day, right? <laughs> I was like, damn, is Battle Right Pro Filer just gonna make me throw someone under the bridge? <laughs> but no, uh, I think the person I have the strongest synergy with is probably Crooks, um, the person I casted the land finals with, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that I 
just hang out with him a lot as a person in like discord calls and stuff like that and we really mesh well as individuals uh like he's somebody that i consider one of my closest friends in the battle right scene so talking with him feels very natural i never have to wonder if he's gonna like speak over me or if i'm gonna speak over him and we have a very strong understanding of how we both like to talk uh, in a cast so I, I think i probably have the best energy with him and he also casted a lot on rival esports right Yes, yeah. Back uh, when he was playing, he was actually competing in some of the Rivals tournaments, and then I heard him cast a joke tournament um, put on by a, a player named Chalt. He put on this like small community tournament mm -hmm. and had Crooks, Crooks cast the first one, and I was like, even though Crooks was really memeing hard during the cast, I was like, dude, this this guy's really good at speaking, and he has some uh, really important, like, interesting ways of looking at the game, so I was like, you should cast with me on the Rivals show. It, it could be really fun. It might be better than playing for you. And uh, I really want to cast with you. So I drug him on with me and uh, ended up casting the Rivals shows for like six months or so. Temporarily ended his player career then. Yeah, I, I broke him out of the, <laughs> the team. His teammates were not too happy with me, but you know, that's life. All right. Uh, <laughs> okay, so... Moving forward then from Rivalry Esports and the BPL, SLS decides to do the Battle Right Pro League. Yes. How early on in the creation of that were you brought on board as a caster? So I, as a caster, I wasn't like confirmed for it until maybe like a, a couple weeks, a month before. Uh, but I was always pushing. From the moment I heard the BPL was happening, I was like, hey, Grim Goon, hey, Grim Goon, I want to cast this. I want to do this. This is uh, something I'm really interested in. So I was always pestering him about it and making sure he knew I had interest. Um, so, and then like a month before it started, he they finally kind of formalized it and brought me on board. And uh, I actually moved out of state to come do it. I lived in uh, Washington, maybe a 16 hour drive away. And I, I Put all my stuff in a truck and moved down and uh, made casting my gig. Cool. Kind of sounds like this Hollywood story, you know? I'm going to go for <laughs> it. I'm, I'm just going to pack all my shit in the car and I'm going to go there. I'm going to make it. Yeah, and you know, that that's kind of the way it felt. Uh, it, it seems kind of silly to talk about, but it, it was like one of those moments where it was like, if I don't do this, when I'm yeah. 40 years old, I'm going to look back on my uh, young adulthood and I'm going to regret the decisions I made. I was like, this is one of those things I have to do to chase the dream or else I will regret it forever. All right. I'm glad you decided to go for it. Um, so take us through a day of BPL then. How does your work day look? So a day of casting the BPL, we get up pretty early and show up to the studio about three hours before the broadcast starts, just so we make sure everything's set and ready to go. And then, uh, you know, we cast the event lasts maybe five or six hours, unless it's like the best of five format, like last mm -hmm. season, then we're casting for like 10 hours. But um, so it's just generally a lot of sitting behind a desk and talking and the uh, there's not much more to it than what you see on the camera on my end. Of course, there's a lot of production stuff that's happening, but thankfully for me, I'm not too in. Well, maybe thankfully is the wrong word, but I'm not too involved with that just because I'm brought on as a caster. So my job's pretty straightforward. So, but in those three hours, then when you and Findable Carpet are there preparing, what do you talk about? How do you uh, we prepare? talk? We talk about the teams that are going to play and like the interesting rivalries between players like if stro is playing against a verse we talk about how they used to like be on a team together and how we should bring that up during the broadcast and we just talk about interesting ways to talk about the game like we talk about the interesting strategies or what teams are doing and what's falling out of favor pretty much thinking about all the things we can talk about to give context to the broadcast because outside of just like watching games um there's a lot of stuff happening so there's a lot of interesting stuff to bring on and we pr we just think about the most cool way to bring on information that we think is important okay so um you're only on the bpl in the land there were a bunch of other casters but in the actual bpl in the league you only work with findable carpet now right um, well, Findable Carpet and for uh, week two of the season one BPL, we had Dreadnought. And, yeah, yeah, okay, I remember that. Yeah. yeah, so other than him, it's mainly just Findable Carpet. And you mentioned that you 
uh, worked with them on the first battle right back in the day, right before you were on yes. rivalry. But then yep. after that, he did battle right, and you were on rivals. Um, mm -hmm. So, kind of some time apart, and now you're working together all of the time. And as a viewer, I think you guys have grown quite a nice synergy. Like you mentioned before, I think you're very like enjoyable to watch and listen to and you've got an interaction between each other that's also uh nice to see how how is it working with findable carpet in your opinion uh carpet is so great i like the words that i can use don't accurately describe how awesome carpet is not only as a person but also a caster like this dude has done so much for me. Like it, he let me live in his house for a little while as I moved down here to cast BPL. He's a pleasure to work with. He's very, very helpful when I have questions. He He's pretty much like the best person a new caster like me could have been paired with, not only because of experience, but also because of his compassion. Like just in general, working with Findable Carpet has been one of the best professional experiences of my life. That dude's a gem. All right. Cool, and he casts other things than uh, than just battle yeah. right, right? I've yep. seen him on, on Rocket League, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't yeah, know if he very... casts. He uh, he also casted a, a Fortnite show yesterday, mm -hmm. so he's casted Rocket League, he's casted Fortnite, he's casted Battle Rights, he's casted. Um, I believe he hosted a PUBG show. Like that, that dude does it all. Um. Yeah, so I imagine you must have learned a lot from working with him. Did did you feel like you could take some of that knowledge and like pass on to to newer casters? Like you worked with Jolts now on the LAN? Right. Did yeah, you feel I like think, you were uh, the experienced one? Uh I did feel like I was the experienced one at um the Dream League final or not Dream League, but Dream Hack final, mm. but only I only had so much experience, right? Uh, but a lot of the stuff that Carpet did for me, I found myself doing for Crooks and Jolts, like setting them up with easy questions like, hey, that was a really weird initiation by X player. What do you think about that? So a lot of like the the ways Carpet used to help me when I was struggling on a broadcast, I found myself doing to my co-casters. Uh, so I definitely picked up a lot from working with Carpet. All right. Why was he not at the LAN, by the way? I think he was casting the Rocket League LAN like a, a couple days before. He had prior obligations. All right. He doesn't have his priorities in check. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay, so I, I would like to talk about Season 1 of the BPL. Since, since you've seen all of the games of right. uh, Season 1, I thought it'd be interesting to look back at it with you. Um, mm. And instead of just going through like everything that happened, because there were a lot of games and a lot of teams. Right. Um, first of all, I want to ask you about the qualifiers, because since you're an old player, I'm guessing you knew most of the players who actually qualified mm -hmm. into the league. But was there a team that either qualify or didn't qualify that surprised you? Uh, yeah, on the European side, Pulse Drunk really surprised me that they made it into the BPL. Uh, those players, I didn't even recognize their names, to be honest, during the qualifiers. I was like, who is this group of people, and how did they make it in? They even made it in in like the third qualifier, I think, not even the last one. Um, so they beat quite a couple good or quite a few good teams to make it in. On the American side, a team that I was surprised made it in um, was... Uh, who eventually turned into Noble Esports. Uh, Luke Wa and I believe his name now is Fallen, yeah. used to be Nards. Nards yeah. Uh, yeah, they made it in, and I was pretty impressed by how they did. Uh, of course, neither of these two teams did too well in their respective groups, but they still made it into the BPL, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Was there, like, uh, if we talk about Pulse Drunk then, was there any European team that we didn't get to see that you kind of expected to have the spot that they ended up taking uh there were a couple players that i think were forming teams they might not have ended up playing in the season one qualifiers but there were players like back in the old day 213 213 the winner of the uh, european enter the arena previously the biggest battle right tournament i thought mm -hmm. he would be in the league for sure he's incredibly talented uh, on pretty much all roles other than support <laughs> I've seen him play ranged. I've seen him play melee in general. He's just a very good player. Another player I thought would make it in was Condemned on the European side, but I think he quit 
uh, just a little bit before season one started. Um, but I think both of those two players will be in season two. So I'm really excited to see that. Yeah. Um, we'll get back to that, to season two yes. in a bit. Um, but okay, moving on to groups. Like like I said, instead of just going through everything that happened, I thought we could do this. First, we'll talk about NA, then we'll talk about EU. And I think that it would be cool if we took one team each that we feel like, I want to talk a bit about this team. This team was particularly interesting during group stage. Mm -hmm. So since you're my guest, I'm going to let you go first and think of a team that you think was especially interesting to talk about in the North American group stage. All right. I got one. Already. Nice. <laughs> Already. It, it was instant. I was like, I know who I want to talk about. All right. Go. Uh, the team that was really interesting to me was um, Fable. Of course, hi there, Stro, and also my name is Keith. Three incredibly good players that kind of group together um, to play in the BPL. Stro in particular is one of my favorite players. For as long as the battle race scene has been around, I've been admiring his play. He's incredibly good. He's a very, very smart drafter. And even though he wasn't the captain on this team, I have no doubt that his influence on the team was notable. So watching him play with some of, or one of my favorite people, Hi There, was just truly a treat. Hi There and I, of course, good friends. We hang out in Discord pretty often, just chatting, hanging out um, alongside Crooks and a couple other people. So I really, really enjoyed watching this team. It was a little bit hard not to let my bias shine through, and I'm sure at times it did a little bit. Um, but for that reason, I really, really enjoyed Fable. It was also cool because their characters were incredibly strong on the patch of Season 1 BPL. Of course, Older, an insane character Season 1. Rook, also very strong before the Season 1 finals. Um, so these guys were always like a, a powerhouse in my mind and people I really respected. All right. Um, I'm glad you picked Fable because since I was going to let you go first, I thought I have to pick two. And one of the teams <laughs> that I picked was Fable because I want to talk to you about them. So mm -hmm. for me in North America, like going into the league, I think most people were looking at Youngsung and Space Station Gaming. Right. Like it's the, the championship in title in NA is going to be between those two and those two teams are like already they punched in their tickets to land pretty much I think right. was the common conception but mm. Fable actually looked really really strong right up until they got knocked out in playoffs mm -hmm. um, what would you say make them so good was it I just because we had this Rook older Ivan meta in playoffs sure. right and sure. as you said that's th that's pretty much their characters so mm -hmm. first off do you think they would be as strong in different meta or did they kind of hit the meta jackpot i think that like obviously they hit the meta jackpot but i think they still would have done well had they been on other characters like season one of bpl week one hi there was playing shifu and he looked incredibly good on it uh, I've seen Stro also play characters like Lucy, and he's looked very good on them, or on her. Uh, and Keith, also a Jade player from back in the day. So all of these three players are more versatile than just like the one champion pick that that meta yeah. dictated. Of course, the Rook Iva older was very good, but I think they did have potent secondaries. Yeah. I mean, the Rook older Iva was only like the, the thing for playoffs, I think. Yeah, yeah. In group stage, everyone played other stuff. Mm-hmm. Okay, so do you think they'll they'll be one of the stronger teams in Season 2 as well? You know, uh, unfortunately, I've heard some rumblings that they won't even be playing. I know... Oh, um, really? Str yeah, Stro, my name is Keith, and hi there. Uh, seem not to be playing together very often. I think they've kind of disbanded and gone their own way. That's a shame. I um... know. So that should mean that we'll have an open qualifier for North America. I know yes. we'll have that for EU. I didn't I didn't actually know we'd have that for NA. Well, that kind of sucks. <laughs> yeah, I was really right. looking forward to seeing if Fable could, you know, rise above and knock down one of Youngsung or Space Station Gaming. Mm -hmm. But oh well. So I guess the interesting thing will be to see in what 
teams these players might come back then? Or have all three of them quit? Uh, I think Stro has taken a step back from mm -hmm. the competitive scene. But I think My Name is Keith and Hyther are still looking for teams. I'm not sure if either of them have found one, but I'm hoping they do. Yeah, they probably will if they want to, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but then we've talked about Fable for a bit. I would like to talk about Young Sung as well. Yes. Uh, because uh, it might seem obvious since they did so well, but I think the way in which they did it was really interesting mm -hmm. because Young Sung in BPL and Young Sung that we saw right before BPL, I feel like even though there's the same players kind of looked like completely different teams. Yeah, it, it looked like they kind of leveled up in a way, didn't it? Yeah. They kind of figured out that, okay, let's f screw everything that we just that we knew before this. This is how we play and this is how we win. And then they just did it and stomped groups. Um, and when talking to Jeter, he talked about their strengths as uh, being able to flex pick as much as they do and being able to bring out as many comps as they can would you agree right. that that is like what makes them so strong like the core Absolutely. of their strength yeah like they can play so many different characters they're all very versatile which I think makes them very hard to draft against which is going to be very interesting when we see season 2 start yeah. um, but I think another strength that isn't uh, often enough mentioned is just how good ninjas is i think ninjas as a player is up there with the best of the best and a lot of the people like in the community i, I think don't give them enough credit i think that kid is insanely talented and it really shined in the matches they played at the bpl season one finals uh, he just looked really good and when you add that star player aspect with like the unpredictability of the draft i think it just sets up a, a really good sort of chemistry for a team to be successful Okay, that's interesting. Uh, what what do you think is the reason for that, that he's not as hyped as maybe he should be? I think it's because he's really quiet. Like, Averse streams a lot, Jolt streams a lot. People see their play, uh, they hear their voices, they, like, recognize them more so on a team because of it. Um, so those two players are, like, known for being really good. Ninjas is, like, the polar opposite. That dude is silent. You cannot get a word out of him. Um, he doesn't stream, he doesn't tweet, he's very, very quiet. He just kind of shows up, plays his matches, and then takes off. Uh, so I think simply because he doesn't put himself out there, people recognize him less. Yeah, that that was kind of was what I was thinking. I talked to a verse mm. and he said the same thing about when he was mm. on, was it ooh, Legendary with Arakune yeah. and Ninjas? And he said yes. that me and Arakune are two parents fighting and Ninjas just... Didn't <laughs> say a peep ever. Yeah. It's just like, oh shit, mom and dad are fighting again. <laughs> yeah, it's funny if you go back and listen to the old tourney vods of Legendary on Versus Stream. Ninjas never says anything. Yeah. It really is just that like mom and dad arguing kind of thing. I should make that my life goal and to have a battle ride profile with ninjas. Dude, just yeah, that would be sick. <laughs> If you managed to do that, that would get so many views, I bet. People would be so excited. It's like, oh, he exists. I'm 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 gonna work on that. Okay, but <laughs> let's let's move over to EU then. Um okay. and then I think we're I was thinking we could do the same thing for both regions, but for playoffs as well. Because I think some teams were actually very different going from groups to playoffs as well. But let's start right. with the group stage of EU. Is there a team that was particularly interesting for you? Uh, I, I always thought watching the gatekeepers was really interesting. Of course, three very good players, Rutha, Hot Biscuit, and Jolts. And I also just really liked watching their play style. I liked how reserved they were in their gameplay and how they would just have these explosive moments where Rutha would find like a double in cap and Hot Biscuit would get a, like a double ulti uh, reliably. It just made watching them very fun. Yeah. Yeah, I enjoy gatekeepers a lot as well. Um, and they, I, in my opinion, they were kind of the young sung of EU, right? How everybody, because SSG and Impact were like the two best teams in their regions yeah. before BPL season one. And gatekeepers kind of came in and 
I think they... I don't remember if they went 1-1 one, one in groups versus Impact or if they 2 0 Yeah. They went 1-1. One, one. Impact lost one of the games against them 5-0. It was like a, a stomp because of yeah. the bad draft. Yeah. Yeah, it might be that stomp that makes me think that. But I think still overall, like, Gatekeepers in groups, I think Gatekeepers seemed like the best team in EU. Yeah, yeah, they looked really good. Of course, they took that game off impact, so they kind of showed they were, like, competitors. And similar to Youngsung, like you're saying, before BPL Season 1, Gatekeepers looked kind of rocky. Like, Jolts has not had a lot of success since the days of Bruce Lee when he played with Clarny and um, uh, Nye, who doesn't play anymore. Yeah. So for him to come back and have success was very cool for him because, you know, he hasn't had that for a long time. Yeah. And as a support. So we have this yeah, role yeah. swapping there as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, I think maybe a lot of the reason they had success was because of that too. I think uh, Jolt's having to learn a new role, support being so fundamentally different than both ranged and melee, I think that might have helped him kind of like relearn the game a little bit and come at it from a fresh perspective, which I'm sure impacted his play positively. Yeah. I mean, talking to him right before... Uh, season one started it was after the qualifiers um right he, he kind of said that or at least that it helped immensely in his joy in the game like his yeah, love for yeah. the game mm -hmm. how he thinks that playing support is just so much fun there's so much going on so much to think about um so I, you're probably right about that 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 has a big impact all right i hmm i i don't know. I have so many teams that I want to talk about in EU in a way because that was really interesting. But I think I'm going to take none of the teams that I wrote down before and actually talk about Game On. Okay. Minis okay. team. Yeah. Because they were the last team to qualify to EU. Right. Mm. And then they went on to win their group undefeated with yep. a minus two point start. Because they had to reschedule games. Yeah, yeah. So I think they were really impressive in group stage. Um, yeah, absolutely. So what are your thoughts on Game On as a team? I think, obviously, Lumi, Ivar, and Mini are incredibly talented players. I think their success in the group stage had a lot to do with the patch as well. Of course, Thorn was very, very strong early in BPL. Yeah. He, he kind of fit the meta perfectly, and he also fit the play style of Game On very well. So it was natural that Thorn would, you know, help carry them to victory a little bit. Not to say that their skill had nothing to do with it, but their comp was very, very strong that patch, and they played it flawlessly. Like, their Taya uh, plus whichever support they were playing, be it Ulrich or Lucy, plus the Thorn, they just always used their escape so well together, played so well as a unit, and I think a lot of that was why they were successful. Um, just good players, great patch for their heroes, and an understanding of how they needed to play. If, if we look forward, then, do you think the fact that they might have had to play different comps made them weaker later on? Uh, yeah, if we fast forward to the the playoffs, I think the comp and the meta change had a lot to do with why they were less successful. I don't mean to sound like I'm characterizing them as like uh, just specialists that don't have any variance in their play. Like Obviously, they're very good players. Um, but when the meta changes so drastically and you rely so heavily on one mm -hmm. play style, you can obviously get messed up by that. Yeah, sure. Um, so, what what do you expect from them going to Season 2? Because, like we said, they, they had to reschedule, so they played all of their games really early. Which means yes. that no change to the patch whatsoever affected them and how they play. Uh, now we got Season mm -hmm. 2. One thing that right. I wanted to talk about a little bit with you later is that we'll have bans. But, you know, that is one thing that could shake up what people play and perhaps they'll have to spread out their games over the course of the entire season this time so they will probably see different patches with different comps being strong and weak so right. where where with that in mind where would you put game on in eu i you know i still think they are probably going to be middle of the pack 
even though a lot of their success in season one relied on the comp that they played, I think they're still very good players, and I'm sure they recognize their weak points. I think going into season two, they're going to have a lot more comps prepared, a lot more hero choices ready. Of course, Mini, an incredibly versatile support player. So if Ivar and Lumi can kind of shake things up a little bit with their own picks, I could see them being very successful. And of course, like you alluded to, since bans have been announced, I'm sure they recognize the need to play more characters, and they will be prepared for the the comp shakeup. Yeah. All right. I hope you're right because I, I kind of think the same that at worst they'll be middle of the pack, but I, I yeah. think they could be really good. Yeah, I think so too. Okay, so if we move on to to NA playoffs, then mm -hmm. was there any team that was interesting to you? It, and I just want to say now, you don't have to do this, but it doesn't have to be like, yeah, I think this team was really, really good. Like, if you think some right. team disappointed you in some way or did something just strange or whatever, but something that stood out to you in the playoffs. There were two teams that stood out to me. Of, of course, the first going to be Space Station Gaming, who yeah. ended up to win the whole thing. They looked like a different team in the playoffs. They... The Space Station Gaming as a group of players have always had a hard time finding what they need to play at the beginning of a patch. And mm -hmm. then eventually they fit into their roles and they recognize what heroes they need to pick to be successful. And that's exactly what happened in the playoffs. They found out what they needed to play and they brought that Rook Iva older and they looked incredible. They looked like the unstoppable force they went on to be in the Dream ha Hack finals. And I think they were very interesting to watch for that reason. On the other side of things, I thought Fireblaze, Flappy Penguin, and oh gosh, the support player, Freak. Uh, they also very much surprised me. Of course, going into the BPL, I kind of thought this team would do poorly, but they made it into the top four, which was very impressive. And to see Fireblaze, Flappy Penguin, and Freak be successful was very cool for me because it showed how much they learned and progressed and improved over a season. And I think to see a team work hard and see results because of it is very cool. Yeah. Um, and that team I see scrimming a lot already. Yeah, on Twitch. yeah. So I know yeah, they're, they're playing for season two. So this question works now. How good do you think they will be in season two? Since given how much. Four? Yeah, given how much they improved in season one, I don't think there's anything holding these guys back from a top four, top three even placement in season two. I, I could see these guys being top three. Flappy Penguin, a player that's always kind of slipped under the radar until BPL really showed he's a force to be reckoned with. And I think Fireblaze is a very smart dude that can pick up what he needs to play when he needs to. And Freak is also slowly stabilizing himself as one of the best support players in North America. So I think in general, this team definitely one to look out for in season two. Yeah, and considering that Fable is out now then, right? Because yeah, I'd yeah. say they were the third best team yeah, last season. Think, but that yeah. kind of makes going into the season, I'd say that these guys are the third best team in my book, at least. Yeah, they're definitely a threat. Okay. But just, uh, there's one thing, one short thing I want to ask about SSG, and it uh, kind of ties into Youngsung as well. <laughs> Um, because the funny thing about SSG winning the finals against mm -hmm. Youngsung in a very convincing fashion is not just that, okay, SSG figured out the meta, they, they played the comp and they just won, right? It's right. also against Youngsung that should have this upper hand in that they can play so many comps, uh, very versatile team. So it kind of raises the question again. What, because this flex picking, being able to play as many comps as possible, is held up by many players as right, right. a huge strength. And then SSG yep. comes in and say, "No, we're not. We're not one. flex picking. I'm only playing one role. You're only playing one role. You're only playing one role. And then for finals or for the entire playoffs." We all have one champion each that we play, nothing else. And we 15-0 the finals. Yeah. Uh, the 15 Odom, like you said, it was pretty gross. I think a lot of that was simply due to how strong that comp was, that patch. Uh, and, of course, the Rook Iva Older was just recently being discovered. So going into it, um, Youngsong only had, like, a week or two to figure out anti-comps. And I think 
the Rook Iva Older is probably one of the strongest comps on that patch that we've seen in Battle Right history. Maybe up there with the yeah. Shifu Sirius Taya of back in the day or the Shifu Sirius Jumong. I think that comp was just incredibly good and Young Sung didn't have enough time to prepare against it. I think a lot of it too was just Young Sung being caught off guard. I don't think they went into that um, final match expecting to lose game 1-5-0. And when that happens, I can't help but feel like it was probably a little bit jarring for Jeter. He was probably like, okay, we got to shake up this draft a lot and figure out something um, to combat this comp. And I think simply because, like I mentioned, that comp was so strong and Jeter didn't have enough time to prepare that he could never really just get a footing, uh, his footing in as a drafter. And they were just kind of lost in that finals. All right. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how things develop in season two. Now that we yes. have bans and people are, people are going to have a hard time just sticking to one comp. But yeah. I, I still think it's interesting that we have teams that think that flex picking and like flexing roles and playing many comps is a strength. And there are some teams that are also like, yeah, this is this is what we do. Yep. So, like a. United in Europe back when they had Naraga just yeah. doing the one thing yeah yeah we're playing comps that are centered around a pearl support this yeah. is what we do <laughs> <laughs> but I like that idea I think it's interesting that we have different philosophies on how you play the game mm -hmm. okay but I want to talk about EU playoffs and I'm gonna can I go first and pick a team of course. This time, because I'm really excited to talk about Dolos in the EU playoffs. Oh, yes. Um, and especially since that game between Dolos and Gatekeepers was, at least up until then, was like the best battle right match I'd ever seen. That match was unreal, man. That was so crazy. It's rivaled now by the grand finals at the DreamHack LAN with how that thing ended with a 2v3 and everything. Mm. But but this game was... I mean, it was intense to watch. I can't imagine playing that game. I was yeah, tired it, from watching it. <laughs> yeah, it went to like game 5, right? And it ended up being a reverse sweep or something. Like I, yeah. Casting that was exhausting. Watching it was exhausting. <laughs> I bet those players all immediately just like crashed after. So... Dolos, I think, is a very interesting team. They, if we go back to group stage, I think some people expected them to do quite well. Clern is right. a very well-known player. People know that Jurgen is great. Uh, your Nightmare, or AKA Crazy, is also a very respected player. And then Game On came in and just looked really good. E United looked really good. And I think people kind of forgot a little bit about Dolos. Yeah, and yeah. And they were the EU representatives for the LAN. Yeah, yeah. They ended up qualifying over um, the gatekeepers, like you mentioned. They definitely shocked a lot of people. So what was it about how Dolos play that made them come out on top over gatekeepers, in your opinion? I think a lot of it had to do with... Um... Jurgen as a captain and a thinker. I think Jurgen is an incredibly smart dude. After spending some time with him at LAN, I, I can I recognize just how intelligent he was. You could see the gears are always turning with that guy, and I think it's reflected in the drafts. Uh, the way he drafted against gatekeepers showed a very deep understanding of their play style and countered them very well. He ended up picking characters that uh, Crazy would be successful on, and he ended up picking the Jumong that just looked incredibly good against the sit back and combo play style of gatekeepers. And I think as a result of just a strong fundamental understanding of the game, they were able to counter the way the gatekeepers want to play. Yeah. And I, I'd like to throw in that Jurgen's Jumong is one of the most beautiful things in the oh. in the game. Yeah, yeah. It, it's either beautiful or enraging, depending on whether you're watching or playing against it. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> uh, but I mean, like the things he can do with that ult, I think is especially yeah. Yeah. impressive, considering how that works, how long that windup is. It's just one slow extremely large arrow that pretty much covers the entire screen everyone knows where that thing is going and he yeah. manages to do so many great things with that ultimate yeah 
the mark of a good player being unpredictable with the most uh, predictable ability in the game yeah so yeah i'm really excited to see how dolos will play in season two and kind of sad that we did even though it was fun seeing hot biscuit at lan that was great yeah but i would have wanted to see dolos play as their full team yeah in the lan like obviously hot biscuit's a very skilled player like yeah. you said but they they had to adopt like a fundamentally different play style with hot biscuit simply because you know he doesn't play like crazy hot biscuit uh jolt even characterizes him as the most passive player in a uh, professional battle right um and hot um crazy is on the complete opposite yeah. side of this spectrum. crazy just goes he just runs in creates a lot of space for jurgen and clarny and they're oftentimes successful because of that so when they had to adjust over to hot biscuit it was obviously such a huge adjustment in such a short amount of time uh, i can't help but imagine it hindered their results and just the fact that you've been a team, that you know each other. Like, yeah, yeah. Just the thing you mentioned about you and Crooks, how you synergize well together, yeah. that thing comes from experience, right? You've yeah. done this thing together so, for such a long time that you know how the other does this thing. These guys mm. know how crazy plays. Like, yeah, he, yeah. I imagine when you start working well as a team, eventually some things you don't really have to call anymore. Because your teammates yeah. just know that this thing is going to happen now, that therefore I will have to be here. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, do this. that's a. That's one of the big parts about Lucy too, like knowing when you need to bury or somebody like Clarny, not having the understanding of how Hot Biscuit is going to play as a teammate. Obviously they understand him as an enemy, but as a teammate, it's like a whole different story. Uh, and not knowing when he's gonna use his iframes make the, makes the job very hard for the Lucy. And it's just like you said, that synergy, it's so important. So this is, this is just pure speculation and uh, we, there's no way to answer it really. But if, if we think about the LAN and how Dolos looked in playoffs, how much better do you think they would have placed in LAN if they could have brought Crazy there? Um, to think about that, I'd have to see the groups again to see how the group stage would go. Yeah. I believe they lost to the South Americans in their group. Yeah, I think yeah, so. I, I think they were kind of the first team that faced the South Americans. Yeah, yeah. So I think they maybe could have placed top four, but beyond that, I'm not too sure. Uh, they definitely would have looked better, though, regardless had they been their full stack. Okay, so on the topic of the LAN, or is there another team that you want to talk about? No, I think we've covered him enough. Yeah. All right, so moving on to land then, since we're already on that topic. How was that for you to be able to go from the online tournaments to actually being at a LAN casting? Uh, it was it was so great. LAN was so much fun. Not, not only was it very like um, affirming for me as a caster in this industry to be like, I'm here at this LAN, I've been invited. This, this is my livelihood. It was like a moment where I was like, I'm successful. I've done it. I I set the goal for myself, and I've kind of made one hit one of the benchmarks. Of course, I still have a very long way to go, but it it was a good first step, and it was very cool to be there casting on land with friends was an unreal experience. All of the people from Sunlock and Dreamhack being there helping, uh, it it just it truly made it a one of a kind and almost like a once in a lifetime feeling event. Yeah, I mean, in a way, it really was. It was the first ever Battle Right LAN, right? Like, whatever happens, yeah. however great they become, this was the first. I, I, just for me, just to have been there and, like, been backstage and seen the thing happen as it did, I think, you know, that's really cool. That This is, this is the first, the first big step of Battle Right Esports, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it was super cool to see you there doing interviews here too. It, it, it was cool to have like everybody involved in the community because a lot of people focus on like the players and the content creators in that way. Uh, but you've also done a ton for the community too. So for you to be there, it really felt like a full event. And even though I like snubbed you on an interview to take a nap, <laughs> like still seeing you there, was it was very cool. Yeah, yeah. And just getting to say hi and chat, I mean, uh... Yeah. That was really nice. But on the topic of you taking a nap and not doing an interview, <laughs> uh, day one, you casted for 12 and a half hours. So oh, yeah. I'm definitely going to 
give you a pass on that one. I would have I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you even remember anything of that day, having worked for almost 13 hours straight? Uh, you know, to be honest, plus towards the end of it, yeah, plus preparations. I, I got up at like six something that morning and went to bed at like two the next morning. But uh, anyways, I, I remember like most of it, but my memory definitely gets foggy near the end. Like at a certain point uh, when you've had like four monsters to drink and you're trying to power through a cast, like shit gets foggy, you know? Yeah. But how did you how did you guys work through that? Because a after like eight hours of casting or something, or maybe when you hit like the ten hour mark or something, you guys must have like said to each other, "Okay, this is this is getting this is getting rough. This day is getting long." Yeah. How did you keep yeah. yourselves going? Um, for me, I I went into the dream hack knowing that would happen, so mm -hmm. I was pretty prepared for it mentally. I was like, okay. I am the rock of this desk. I'm going to need to help my co-casters because they will inevitably get exhausted. And um, like we were talking about earlier, my speech and debate training days from back in high school, I was used to like competing for like 12, 13 hours a day. Um, so I was very um, understanding of what it would do to my voice and how to react and how I needed to control my speaking. Uh, and I pretty much just played cheerleader. I, I was like, I'm going to need to elevate my co-casters to help them be successful because I knew it would be a very, very hard day for them. Um, so a lot of what I did was trying to um, like working around helping them and like setting them up uh, because I, I was, you know, prepared for the struggle. All right. Um, I remember talking to Jolts. He was like, yeah, and the flesh really helped me out a lot. Uh, oh, so I, so I think it worked out. I'm glad he felt that way. That's good. OK, so um, one thing about the land that kind of popped out for everyone was actually how good the red cannons were yeah i think yeah. that was like the big big story of the land aside yeah. from na ultimately turned out to be greater than eu <laughs> the fact that red cannons turned up as the third best team in the world was mm. uh really cool what do you think makes them that good uh, I think a lot of it had to do with people not really taking them seriously at first and not having a preparation or prepared strats against them because of it. Of course, going into the LAN finals in the BPL official Discord channel, people were like, South America is not going to do anything. They're not very mm -hmm. good. And as a result, no one took them seriously. And because no one took them seriously and they're actually very talented players, nobody had prepared strats. So when they came in and played as a unit as tight as they did and also didn't have or people didn't have counter picks ready for them it really set them up to succeed and they grabbed that opportunity and ran with it they played so well it was amazing yeah yeah because i've, I've heard people talk about them as like yeah well you know element of surprise but right. i'm i kind of feel as well like this was a two-day tournament right yeah. and second day people had seen them people had already played them and they yeah. still they eliminated young sung didn't they yeah yeah which is huge they took so third place it's not just yeah they showed up and they won a few best of ones at one day and that's what happened you know yeah these guys are good you can't really take that third place away from them yeah. by using the elemental surprise so yeah it, I, it... yeah go ahead if you place that all in element of su surprise, you're doing them a massive disservice. Uh, the Red Cannons are incredibly talented players. It, it definitely all isn't just that people weren't prepared for them. So did you have any um, clue about South America going into the land? Or was you as surprised uh, as everyone else? I did a little bit of research on the comps they played, but to be honest, I expected um, Red Cannons to place middle of the pack. I, I expected to see the Korean teams in 7th and 8th, mm -hmm. the other South American team in 6th, and then Red Cannons maybe like 4th or 5th. Um, so I, I kind of like knew what they would play, but I didn't expect them to play as like mechanically well as they did. They, they definitely shocked me. Alright. Um, as, as a finishing point to this interview, I would like to look to the future now since we've been looking backwards mm -hmm. for this entire interview so far and the first thing that's coming up right now is season two of bpl it'll start yeah. in a few weeks um so 
one thing that we have now are the bands. Yep. And uh, it's something that a lot of players have called for. It's something that a lot of fans are happy about now. I think if you look at the in the community, it's also something mm. that uh, some fans think will be a bad thing. Sure. For the esports scene of battle right. So I thought it would be very interesting here to hear your take on the bans. So bans are something I've been an advocate for for a long time. Uh, I don't really like calling them bans though, because if Team A bans a character, they can still pick yeah. that character. I, I, I'm trying to think of a new word for it. I, maybe I need your help on this. I'm thinking okay. like calling it restrictions or something. But anyways, uh, since they can like restrict what the other team is going to play, I think it's going to make the draft very interesting, um, which you know I'm very happy about. As somebody that casts all of the drafts, sometimes they get a little bit stale when one team just like picks the same thing over and over again. I think if they're forced to shake it up, it's going to add a, another nice element of like um, uh, like chess like mental chess in a way between the drafters and i think that's something that i'm really going to enjoy talking about on broadcast talking about why x player is banning out lucy um or why they're banning out like jumong when they picked a varesh or something uh i, I think it's just going to make it much more interesting not only for the spectator or the players but also the spectators and in the game I think it's very healthy because it sometimes you just have these comps like Rook Iva older. Yeah. I think a lot of the reason people don't want um, bans is because they think patches can be balanced enough to where a, a one character shouldn't be just removed. But I think inevitably there's going to be balance issues. Nobody is perfect. Even in the most balanced of games, there's always a monster. Um, so I, I think having a ban in the game is very, very good for the competitive scene. And overall, I'm super excited to see how it plays out. Yeah. Yeah, I agree, because I think as well that as a player, you can be skilled at different things, right? And teams can yeah. be have different skills that make them good or bad. And like drafting and preparing and like reading what your enemies will do in the mind game that that is, is definitely a skill that some players have more yeah. than others and a resource yes. that some team can use more than others. And I think this will just add to that part of the game mm -hmm. like you said the mental chess that it is becomes a bigger thing in the game now that we also have bans you don't just ban maps right you also ban I... champs so i'm i'm really looking forward to seeing what will happen there will there yeah, be it's... any other changes in season two when it comes to like the casting and the production of bpl um i don't know how much i can talk about it um no, but i I imagine there will be some things that are similar. I'm hoping that we see a format change. I, I mm -hmm. think the format in the playoffs was too much. I think the best of five win score five was just too draining for the players. And it created a, a spectator experience that wasn't ideal. I don't think people want to sit there for two hours and watch a best of five. But even though there are occasionally very, very good ones like Dolos and Gatekeepers, there are also just stomps. And people don't really want to watch stomps. So I'm hoping we see maybe like a best of three win score five or a best of five win score three to shorten things up a little bit and make it a little bit more compact and clean um, for both myself and the spectators. I think that would be very good for the BPL. Um, but other than that, I'm not too sure what else I would like to have done with it. All right. They said something in the developer uh, blog where they announced things they said we are going to make more content. Which yes. It's a very cryptic word, but I'm like, what is this? What are yeah, they what does do? this mean? Yeah. yeah. So this I... is a this is a conversation I actually just had with Grim, uh, Grimgoon pretty recently. We were talking about the things BPL could do better. Yeah. And we, we came to the conclusion that, you know, there wasn't enough content during season one. Uh, I think like more Twitter content about like stats and like results I think would be very good for the game. Um, maybe more content creators working on BPL stuff. Like, of course, you've been very integral in all of that, a, a very important part of our scene. Uh, I, I think we just need more stuff like that, more Twitter content, more people like you, and uh, I think our scene will be very healthy and grow. Yeah, just one thing, like, you know, how in other esports they have, like, hashtags that the viewers can use and people can see those tweets on yeah. on cast or maybe you can check out some of the tweets that are being made by viewers it's just something that i feel like this would be so easy to implement and think would like make yeah. for a much more fun viewer experience 
Absolutely. And we are kind of a small community, so it just raises the chance to actually have your tweet being read by In the Flesh or Findable Carpet on air, which would be really cool, right? Yeah, I think I think it's fun. People like to be to put themselves out there. They like to be seen on stream, stuff like that. Would be cool, yeah. All right. So if we're not just thinking about the the BPL, so what about in the flesh? What's on the horizon in the future for you? Um, things that I've been doing recently, I've been working on the back end production of a couple of esports broadcasts. Uh, something I am very interested in getting into is some Dota 2 possibly mm -hmm. I, I have a, a large background in Dota 2 and I'm, I'm hoping to maybe do some um, broadcasts of myself casting on my Twitch stream um, just to, to you know see how it feels maybe it'll work out maybe it won't but I think given the situation I'm in there's no reason for me not to try I've been like given so many opportunities if I were not to try to cast things I, I'd be making a mistake all right so Dota 2 scene watch out and make room then i guess uh <laughs> are there any other games that you know that you might not have as much experience in but after having seen them would be like this would be really fun to cast uh i think a lot of my casting style revolves around knowledge and understanding mm -hmm. so to cast something i don't really play is something that seems very scary to me um so i i think i'll kind of stick to what i know for now all right sounds fair okay um before we shut things down here, if people see this interview and think that, hey, this in the flesh guy is just charming, I want to see more of him, where can they find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at in the flesh 93 also on Twitch at in the flesh. Um, yeah, and those are my two main mediums. I use Twitter often. You can also find me on Discord if you want to talk to me about something. I'm always down to just talk to people about Battle Right and stuff like that. So come say hey if you want to know what's up. All right. I urge people to take you up on that offer because it's been a pleasure talking to you about Battle Right for about an hour. Shit, time flies. Yeah, time flies, man. <laughs> All right, but thank you so much for joining me, and uh, I hope we can talk more in the future. Hey, man. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me on. It was a blast. Uh, can't wait to see the video and what other content you put out next. It, it's a pleasure to have you in the scene, man. Thank you. Thank you for all the kind words during the interview as well. Uh, it feels feels great. All right, but take care, man. Yeah, you too.